Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of Season 3 of Legal Wellbeing in Action. Today's episode, Getting Down to the Heart of the Matter, is another installment of this year's theme, Wellbeing, a Deeper Dive. For this episode, I'm speaking with Elizabeth Lynch Phillips, a lawyer and certified professional coach who works with lawyers to find greater meaning and satisfaction in their lives, and with Paul Abrams, a New Mexico trial lawyer and the author of Trial Law as Karma Yoga. Elizabeth practiced law in the D.C. area for 20 years before changing careers and becoming an executive coach. Paul has been engaged in mediation and other daily spiritual practices since 1972. Elizabeth and Paul talk about a holistic approach to the practice of law with an emphasis on focusing within, being present in the moment, and drawing on our true selves in everything we do. They talk about letting go of the notion that we can control every situation and outcome, and they explore the idea that practicing law is just one of many possible means to a deeper end. Ultimately, they encourage us all to strive for a deeper awareness of our true selves, to find alignment with our head, heart, and gut, and to engage life on a daily basis in a richer, more meaningful, and purposeful way. We hope you enjoy the episode, and we really appreciate you listening. Hello again, and thank you all for uh, tuning in to today's podcast. Uh, this is Bill Sleese. I'm the Professional Development Program Director for the State Bar of New Mexico, uh, and also a member of the uh, Wellbeing Committee at the State Bar. And I'm really excited today to have uh, with me a couple of very special guests, Elizabeth Phillips and Paul Abrams, who are going to talk us uh, through um, another episode here of what it means to have that deeper dive into well-being. So Elizabeth, let's start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got to New Mexico, and um, and then we'll talk in a few minutes after that about what you're doing right now with um, your day-to-day -day life and uh, and where uh, where you find that well-being space, and then you know we'll turn to you after that, Paul. So Elizabeth, tell us who are you and and how'd you get here? On a plane, um, <laughs> I was uh, I'm from the D.C. area, and I practiced law there for about 20 years. First as a prosecutor, and then a counsel to a Chapter Seven trustee in bankruptcy, um, and. It toward after about 20 years, I wasn't a particularly happy lawyer, but it sort of seemed like I, I'd gone to law school. So what else am I supposed to do? And ultimately I hired a coach to help me decide if there were other options for me. And I ended up being so intrigued by that process that I became a coach. Excellent. And that kind of um, morphed with my husband's and my decision to move us and our kids to New Mexico. To Santa Fe. Well, he has family that's been here for a couple hundred years. So, um, so when I got here, I became a member of the bar just because um, I didn't know any lawyers here. I didn't want to practice law here because I had already switched professions to coaching, but I just wanted to get to know the legal community and that's what I did. So um, I've been a member of the bar. I think I've gone inactive now, but I've been here about 10 years. Um, Fabulous. And uh, Paul, um, how about you? How did, how, where, where from and how did you get here to um, your practice in New Mexico? Well, in some ways, uh, my journey is not usual for people, but in other ways, I think that it, it is uh, somewhat uh, reflective of Northern New Mexico, Santa Fe, and this area. You know, we, we call ourselves the land of enchantment, but uh, New Mexico can also be the, uh, the land of entrapment. And um, my, my path, in a way, has been really toward um, politics and government. Um, from an early age, that is what I intended to do uh, career-wise. And so uh, when I went to law school, uh, I, I also uh, went to graduate school at the same time, and I got a master's degree in government. And my first career was in government and politics. Uh, I wrote speeches. I uh, was on uh, Ted Kennedy's uh, Senate Campaign Committee, uh, and um, 
went back to my home state of Pennsylvania, uh, and my first job was as chief of staff for the Speaker of the House of Representatives in Pennsylvania. And I did that for about five years. Uh, then the governor called and asked if I would be interested in running a new uh, program in Pennsylvania, a medical malpractice arbitration program. Uh, and frankly, I had never run a program. I had always been the whisperer. Uh, and I thought, well, that could be something interesting. And so I took on that job and I did that for about two and a half years. Um, and one of the things that was actually enjoyable about it is I got to rule on all uh, pretrial motions as part of this arbitration program. And uh, in law school, civil procedure, frankly, had been daunting to me. And then when I actually got into it, I found that it was really quite interesting. And, and that was a lesson that, to me, that says when you look at something carefully and involve yourself fully, uh, it can become very interesting, very engaging, uh, and uh, we see it differently than uh, in the past. Um, but I really didn't enjoy running the program. But the big thing that happened to me is that in 1972, I began to practice meditation. Uh, it was a more generic form of transcendental meditation, TM, uh, and, and that became uh, part of my life. Uh, the other thing that happened um, that may be uh, applicable to this conversation is I began a self-study of what I would call the nature of reality. And I began to read a lot. I read uh, Christian mystics, Jewish mystics, Zen Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, Sufism, uh, Vedanta, Hinduism, subatomic physics, uh, and the question to me was, what is reality? What is truth? Uh, and that process that I began uh, in 1972, uh, we're 51 years later, and I'm still engaged in it. Yeah, that, I, and that's, that's fascinating. And I, I definitely want to talk a little bit more. So as you said, I mean, that's been 51 years that you've been doing this. Um, and certainly, um, is reflective of sort of this, the whole notion of a deeper dive, right? Thinking, thinking down below the surface, what, what is reality? What is truth? But, but before we get too far into that, um, let me, let me bounce back to Elizabeth just for a minute. Now, Elizabeth, you mentioned earlier that you hired a coach I, I, and that you became so uh, interested in, in that um, relationship um, in, in how coaching works, in what a coach does, you actually became a coach, mm -hmm. um, and you're a certified coach. Um, I, I guess, hopefully by now, a lot of our listeners know what coaches do, and I don't necessarily want you to get too far into that. But, but now that you're a coach, are you sort of what is your what does your life look like, and and how are you showing up in that life in a way that that does make you happy, that does resonate? Because you said, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily a happy lawyer. Right. My sense is you are now, but you're not lawyering in the traditional sense that maybe a lot of our listeners are. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, I'm actually not really lawyering at all. So, um, but I'll tell you, so when you, when you become a coach, like sort of standard coach, coaching, training, coach approach is a client comes and tells you they have a goal and you support them and help them meet the goal. And when I first graduated from coaching school, um, I thought, well, I should work with lawyers because that's an unhappy group. Um, I and, and maybe I can help them. But I realized that my mindset was that the only answer I have for unhappy lawyers is get out, just run, you know, because because this is a this profession will eat you up. I had a lot of opinions about the profession. And so as my 
my training has uh, evolved and also also doing a lot of the same kind of reading that Paul just described. So on my own time, because I'm really interested in it and fascinated by it, I started to morph into helping lawyers. First, it started in terms of you can still practice law, but you can do it differently. You can go to work and be a very competent, proficient, successful lawyer, but show up differently. So that was kind of my first step into this deeper dive territory, which, by the way, I love this topic this year. Thank you and you and the bar for doing this. Um, and, and it's even evolved still in that, um, which is kind of where I hope we can touch during this conversation is um, that for me, law has the practice of law, at least I help, I hope to help my clients hold it differently in that it is a way to practice being a more present, fully conscious, heartfelt, authentic human. And going to work and practicing law is kind of like an arena in which to do that versus let's talk about you being a good lawyer or a happier lawyer. So it's right. kind of even flipped still. I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, no, it, it, it definitely does. And it, and it sounds to me, it strikes me, um, you know, having, having gotten to know you, having worked with you, it, it's that idea of, of integration of, mm -hmm. um, Rather than siloing, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a good lawyer today, and then I'm gonna do this for my well-being tomorrow, and yes. then I may be miserable as a lawyer, but I'll work hard at it, so then I can go have fun and really enjoy my life. And it's yes, it's, yes. it's really trying to now connect the notion in my mind um, that you can be a lawyer, you can be a great lawyer, um, but you can experience that, and you can show up as who you are as a person, and through the practice of law is just one way that you might experience that, that you might demonstrate it, that you might have that integration. Right. And, and, uh, a way to grow in our, because nobody, you know, either snaps their fingers or hires somebody or, and just becomes this fully evolved human or, you know, heartfelt, authentic. That's, that takes time. It's a, I think it's a lifetime of work. And so for me and my clients going to work every day is, um, that's where you practice it. Yeah, and and I would say, Paul, you you sort of are exhibit A for that discussion, right? Because you mentioned <laughs> yeah. you mentioned you started this practice seventy two years ago, uh, not seventy two years ago, fifty fifty one years ago in nineteen seventy two, um, and that you're still learning, that you're still growing, that you're still doing it. But many of our listeners may may know you, many of them may not, and and many of them don't uh, know that you're in that space that a lot of lawyers occupy, right? Which is working in the rough and tumble litigation world. Um, and, and, um, and, you know, you're, you're a member of the uh, Trial Lawyers Association. Um, you get into court, you advocate for clients, you have opposing counsel who are trying to move in the opposite direction. I mean, it, it's that, that adversarial sort of notion. And yet, you found a way to integrate the spiritual practices, your beliefs into that practice. Tell our listeners, how, how does that work? How, how, how does it show up for you? Well, my ent entry into practicing law uh, here in New Mexico uh, actually came um, from wanting to add another spiritual practice to my life. Uh, I had been involved in meditation, chanting, uh, contemplation for about 11 years, and, um, and eventually um, two attorneys that I knew, one of whom I used to go to his house Friday nights for a meditation group, and he had found out somehow I'd been an attorney in my prior incarnation uh here um said to me they had the right pitch uh come and practice law with us uh, as karma yoga the yoga of work and um up to that point i had been told by uh, or asked to join this practice for four years and i didn't I was helping to run a, uh, a uh, independent uh, uh, press uh, called John Muir P Publications. So my entry was 
to add a spiritual practice. I thought to myself, you know, when we go to work for six, seven, eight, nine, or more hours a day, um, can we get two for one? Can we do our work, support ourselves, our families, uh, make a difference in the world? And can we also uh, feed our spiritual nature, our emotional nature? And to me, the, the idea of karma yoga, the, uh, which is a practice of um, uh, a spiritual practice involving work of action, can that uh, be something I can add to my repertoire? And the basic uh, message uh, with karma yoga is to put full attention to what we are doing and be detached from the outcome. And that's simple and easy to express, but I'll tell you, it's much harder to, to actually do. Um, as are many things that are of significance in life, because we, we care about our clients, we care about justice, we care about the quality of our work. And so this idea of being detached from the outcome may seem uh, to be somewhat uh, um, foreign from that. But this question and, and the answer uh, that Elizabeth and you uh, spoke about is really about integration. We are one, in my view anyway, we are one being. We play various roles. We, we may be attorneys. We may be spouses. We may be brothers or sisters. We may be volunteers. Um, and so those are different roles that we play, but at the core of those roles is who we are as beings. And so that integration into our life to make us and to, to have us feel that we are one entity and that we play various roles um, is something that's important to me. Yeah, and, and it, it's interesting you talk about being detached from the outcome. And I, I, when I hear that, uh, it, if somebody was only casually listening, they might think, uh, oh, well, that means not caring about what happens. And I don't, I certainly don't think that's what you mean. I think it's more that notion of recognizing that we show up as a whole person, not overly investing in the idea of this is the outcome we have to have that we must expect, um, and and then measuring ourselves against the notion of well, was I good enough? Was I bad? You know that that sort of thing. It's it's more detached in the sense of show up as who you are, giving that effort, um, but not being so. Um, um, tied to what exactly you think the outcome maybe should be. And, and I know, Elizabeth, you and I have talked about that in the past. It's, it's that, that concept of, well, that seems like an obstacle in my way. I need to push that aside because this is the outcome I want to get to. And you have a great phrase about obstacles um, that I know you've borrowed. But Yeah, I did borrow it. Just that the obstacles in your path are your path. Yeah. Um, and tell us, tell us what that means. Basically that whatever challenge, well, one way to look at it is whatever challenges show up in front of you, that's what's here now and that's your work. And so putting your kind of full attention on it is, that is your work. And so that's kind of, I think it's a little pointing to what Paul's talking. It's kind of like cooperating with life, like not arguing with what is. And, and to get back to, I think I, my language is different than Paul's, but um, this is kind of why I started to gently shy away from this. Okay, you're here with a client. You're here. You want to be over there. You want to get that goal. Let's get you there. Let's get you away from where you are and over to the thing you want. And what I started to see is I can help people. I could help people do that. But when they get to the thing, much like you get to the outcome of a trial, you win, right? That is a very brief moment of, oh, Yay. And then you're worried about the next thing. 
So it's, it's like our attention is always down the road. And just from the various readings and, and uh, teachers I've listened to, it's there's such a being a fuller, more present human is about what's what are you doing right now? And, and it doesn't mean you don't care about I mean, it doesn't mean you're being um, careless about the outcome. It just means often the outcome is better, actually, by focusing on what's happening right now and how you're being with it. Right. So you're being fully you're, present now, right now with whatever's in front of you, not with your mind later. Because I yeah, think we mostly live in the later. <laughs> and, and, and your approach is you're in, you need to be in this moment. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to what's coming up next week, especially because w you create this false construct sometimes. I, I know I have in the past of, well, if I can only get past today, then tomorrow's going to be wonderful. And if oh, I yeah. can only get past this obstacle, then I'm going to be so happy next week. And then, of course, next week shows up and there I am again, not always all that happy. So it's right, that. Right. But, but, but part of it too is that idea of if you're fully present, you're feeling right. You're, you're. Yeah, that's a that's a key. And so and, part of elements of being present are actually knowing what your emotions are in the moment, just being aware, turning on that ability to know. Okay, right now I'm feeling a little angry or scared. Not trying to argue with that, just noticing it, and also your body is a biggie because I think the 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 West, the, our culture in general, but certainly lawyers are very, very um, run by our, our heads. But isn't there, let me ask you this, 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 yeah. hopefully I won't catch you off guard with this question. Isn't there a risk in that, isn't there a risk in that approach? And, and here's what the risk is, I think. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to feel, I'm going to practice law from my heart, my feeling. Um, when things present as an obstacle or they're painful, I don't like feeling that. <laughs> so right. why can't I just shunt that side of it off? Um, what, what does that end up doing? Yeah, how's that work for you? It's uh, <laughs> Right, it doesn't work out so right. well. Well, yeah. Yeah, what you lose, I think, and it, first of all, what you lose when you start picking and choosing which emotions you're willing to feel, you end up numb. Because if you're at look, oh yeah, heartbreak or sad, no, I can't not convenient for me. It's not very fun. What we end up doing is sort of also losing access to joy and awe and, you know, passion and things that we want. So we don't really get to cherry pick. And it's also, um, I think those things end up biting you in the butt um, because it takes a lot of actual energy to keep them at bay. And you also, when you're, when some of your energy is going toward tamping down things that you actually feel, um, you you don't really have access to as much creativity or what, what I would call wisdom, right? You still have a brain. Brains are great. And lawyers have really good brains. But there's this kind of background, in my view, a higher intelligence, higher wisdom that we can, we do have access to, but not when we're all kind of locked up and compartmentalized. I also want to say, lest anyone think, I mean, you just start screaming or crying in the middle of a trial. That's not it. It's more about just acknowledging, wow, right now I actually really feel scared, just acknowledging it to yourself. And hopefully later on your own time, you can, there are ways to kind of process that. But yeah, so that's kind of, that would be my yeah. answer to your, your challenge. It, it's having access to all of that range, right? Because I, yeah. I know, I know myself, I find if I start dulling the pain, I'm also dulling the joy. Because you, you right. it, it's yin and yang. And actually that kind of transitions to what I was going to ask you, Paul, the, the ebb and flow, the yin and the yang, the, the karma. I mean, you talk about it at karma, right? The, what you put out in the world coming back is sort of a, a very rudimentary idea of what karma is. I don't know that that's what you mean by it, but I know, I know when we talked early on about um, the podcast, you talked a lot about in your practice, integrating the idea of striving for goodness, reaping what you sow. Uh, and the importance of, of really the freedom to choose our actions, but then understanding that sometimes they have consequences. Tell us more about that. How does, how does that fit in when you're busy with, you know, holding a client's matter in your hands? They're expecting this outcome from you. We want to win, 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 win. Um, and, and what you're trying to do is really lawyer from that more holistic standpoint of we've got to do what's right. We've got to do what's just. We've got to do what's good. We, we're going to reap what we sow. 
Well, I, I come at it slightly differently than Elizabeth and maybe your, uh, your way of putting it. Um, I'm a trial lawyer. One thing I know from trying cases is that we can never guarantee the outcome of a case. We can, we, we can put on the very best case we can. We can prepare for days, weeks, and months uh, and, and put on the very best case that we can. And that, to me, is really important as attorneys. But putting on the best case that we can does not guarantee any result. Juries are unpredictable. So I'm a practical guy, all right? And I believe in trying to um, uh, up maximize the upside potential and minimize the downside potential. And, and in doing that, I say to myself, what can I control? Well, I can't control the outcome. So why worry about it? Because I can't control it. But what I can control is my actions. I can use my head, which let's call it the intellect, my heart, let's call it the intuition, mm -hmm. um, and my willpower to move in the best way I can. So if I can't control the outcome, why worry about it? What that does in my experience and my way of going about this is that it detracts from what I can do, mm -hmm. which is to give absolute full attention to what I'm doing, to be one-pointed, to be w just concentrated on what I can do. And since I can't control the outcome, just the outcome takes care of itself. And so by, by doing that, I'm being practical, but I'm also manifesting as best as I can my own spiritual beliefs. I mean, I don't really believe I am the doer, okay? This is my own spiritual belief. I believe that what we may call the divine, what we may call God, what we may call a higher power, Jesus, uh, Buddha, whatever, is more of the actual uh, doer and we are the instruments of the doer. And so when I practice law and represent clients, I try to be as impeccable a doer as I can, to be fully involved, to be fully there with juries, with opposing counsel, with mediators, with colleagues, with and, and to just be there in the present and do what I can do as impeccably as I can. Now, one other thing that touches on this is this idea of, of being in a state of equanimity. Now, equanimity, in my view, is not a static state. It's a dynamic state. And for me, in my, my, my real life, my full life, not just my legal life as a, as a trial lawyer or as a board member of legal aid or whatever, that equanimity is a value that I seek. And I think for attorneys, my sisters and brothers, in the bar who are listening to this, that I think we all, whether we articulate it or not, want to be in that state of equanimity. We want to feel a certain sense of well-being, whether the world is praising us and patting us on the back or 
kicking us in the ass. And I, frankly, don't want to be like a yo-yo. When everything's going well, I feel great. When things aren't going so well, uh, I, I don't feel very good about it. I don't want to be in that state. And so, to me, what I have found that's helpful is to, in fact, be detached from those kinds of outcomes so that I'm not up and I'm not down and I'm not going back and forth. And as an attorney, you know, frankly, you know, I, I, I know that I can't control outcomes. Clients have their expectations, but I can't guarantee an outcome to my client. All I can say to my client is, I will work hard on your behalf. I will do everything that I can do ethically, legally, morally to advance your, your case, your legal matter, but I can't guarantee any, any outcome. And that's how I go about it. And I, I, I feel a certain deep level, frankly, of um, uh, personal value uh, that I, and self-confidence that if I do that, and the word I like is impeccable, if I do that as impeccably as I can, um, to use my head, to use my intuition, to use my experience, uh, my training, that's all a client can ask of me. That's all I can ask of myself. And to me, that brings emotional fulfillment. You know, the, the outside things in our lives, we don't have that much control over. We do have more control over with the interior part of our, how we experience things. That combination between the outside facts of our life and the interior, um, uh, let's call it uh, experiences of it, um, is where we have more control. When we combine that, that brings us the meaning, I think, in our lives. And if we are, you know, it, it's so easy to say, you know, like the Buddha said, uh, and I'm not a Buddhist, but, you know, be good and do good. Well, that's, that's really simple, easy peasy. But it's not so easy peasy. Uh, and in real life. But I think it's well worth the effort and that whatever effort we make in integrating a whole life, uh, making ourselves uh, exemplars of the golden rule. We can't say to a jury uh, anything about the golden rule in, in a closing argument, but what we can do, I think, as attorneys as human beings, as, you know, from my perspective, as children of the same divine being, what we can do is um, try to treat other people the way we want to be treated. Yeah, and I, I that's I love, what I bring to it. I, I, I love the the use of that term. Uh, you don't want to be a yo-yo because I think, um, and I've experienced it myself. When you start allowing external validation um, mm -hmm. to be the source of your happiness or external troubles to be the source of your misery, you're going to be on that roller coaster, that yo-yo, um, and and you sort of self-define then at that point, well, I'm a great lawyer because look at that trial I won. Oh, I'm a crappy lawyer because look at the outcome I got on that. It's not being true to yourself necessarily, and it's not getting to that lawyering from the inside out, right? Um, and it's not getting to that deeper heart, which I know, Elizabeth, that's a concept that is important to you. Tell us a little about that. Um, well, that's a lot of, there's a lot there. 
Um, and I, I wanted to say about the, it kind of all gets back to why I love this episode specifically about who you're working on, like how you're working on yourself internally is more important than, I mean, that's the foundation and then you go to work. And it could be as a lawyer, it could be as a trash collector, it could be as an accountant, um, it doesn't matter. Right, and that and that was going to be my question to both of you, and and maybe a great way for us to to wrap this up. Is this about just being a better lawyer? No, I I personally think showing up with your with your first question, how am I being? Am I being present? Am I being um, how guarded am I being? Am I being open and available to other people and present and actually listening? Um, that's hard for lawyers. It's hard for anybody, but I, I think I love what Paul is saying about trying to control outcomes. We try to control everything. And there is a bit of, I mean, an invitation to kind of do your very best in the moment when you can and let go from there. And sometimes you're going to win and sometimes you're going to lose. And, and as long as you've shown up fully and done your best and focused, then that's, there is a way you can it's a little bit of asking people to kind of trust life and that's hard, <laughs> um, you know, because we think it's all up to us. I think um, I don't happen to believe that as much, but um, it, what was your original question? I've lost. I've lost no, no, I, I think you've hit on it. it, it it's that notion. And, and I love also what Paul said and, and what you said about the idea that we think we can control everything. Right. And, and Paul talked about us. We're not the doers. I mean, we're not the, the right. Ultimately, there's something else. We're the instrument, right? And right, part, right. Of that, or part of that, yeah. Yeah. And part of that means you've got to trust life. You've got to trust that whatever it is, that sort of greater notion of it's flowing through you. And, and, and if you get in the way, because or argue you're with it, or argue with it, or push back against <laughs> yeah. it, right? right? You're trying to control it. Um, how does that make you? Happy, it doesn't. How does it make you a better lawyer, a better person? It doesn't, right? And I think both of you have talked about the idea that it, the end game here isn't be well so you can be a better lawyer. The end game is be well. And by the and way, you, you may will end be. up being a better lawyer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, exactly right. To be, the, the being a better attorney by being a whole person, an integrated person, with our head, our heart, our, our spiritual being that we have some intimation of, but maybe not a, a full understanding of, is, is, is the way, you know? And, and to me, every faith is a path, and it doesn't matter which one you get on. And uh, whether it be humanism or Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever, um, we, by in fact being who we really are, you know, not these little egos, not these views of ourselves, um, that um, that is, is much more helpful. One, one last thing maybe, Bill, is that, you know, in in the West, when we talk about death, we an expression sometimes heard is the person gave up the ghost. Well, in Eastern uh, religions, uh, the, the the expression is the person gave up the body. So the question to me, one of the questions anyway, is: Are we the body? Or are we the dweller within the body? I happen to believe in the latter. And so uh, trying to be more perfect uh, representations of that truth helps us get emotional fulfillment. And it, uh, it, it, I think it makes us better attorneys, better spouses, better friends, because we are moving toward that, that, that sense of uh, goodness and, and, and truth. Yeah, and, and that reminds me of a concept, and Elizabeth, I want you to finish us up with, with uh, your thoughts on this. 
that you and I have talked about that uh, and, and we touched on it a little bit earlier and I think you specifically talked about and Paul talked about the different roles we play in life. Um, I, I know in some of the meditative practice and some of the other practice you do that that you really have a, a an insight or a view into there's a core of who we are um, that mm -hmm. sort of can step back and look at what we do or what we're engaged in but it's not necessarily who we are and and what we're trying to get to is that when we talk about the deep heart or the the self mm -hmm. what that is what that that sort of quiet presence is tell us a little about that to help us finish up on that note mm -hmm. well uh from a practical standpoint, um, that's, I think, or one way to look at it is it's the part of you that's able to pay attention, like the part of you that's kind of in the background that can notice your physical sensations, notice that you're having emotions, noticing that you're having thoughts. And it's, if you can slow down enough, which I know is a, a big ask these days, yeah, but to pay it, like kind of notice that, oh, my feet are on the floor and I feel a little sad and I, I can tell my brain's busy. There's a part of you that's able to notice that that's there prior to those things. So that's, that's a super, you know, shallow primer on that. But, um, but, but why is that important? Why is that pure presence important? Because if, if you can actually touch it occasionally, it is more quiet and more spacious. And that's kind of access to what I think what I would call being versus doing. And we are, we are society and certainly a, a profession of doers. We're doing, we're doing, we're doing. And it's all kind of on the horizontal. And it's not a, there's a way we don't ever really land and be more grounded. And from there, make, I think, wiser decisions, have access to more creative ideas, whether it's in a trial um, or, or, you know, anything else that you're engaged in. And, and the thing I wanted to touch on that is this, that Paul kind of said too, is this idea of roles that um, I, I know you've done a lot of succession planning um, CLEs and I, I went to the first one you did and, and I looked around the room and my heart just really went out to some of these lawyers who are close to retirement. My dad and my stepfather both, my stepfather's plan was to die at his desk. That was his stated plan. And he almost did. Um, and I was just like, really? That, it, because I think some ways it's so hard to retire because you start to think that's who I am. Lawyering is, I, a lawyer is who I am. And to me, that's, that's, a, that's a, it's a misunderstanding. That's a role. And so this kind of question of, all right, if I took away my, you know, my role as a mother or a sister and a, a lawyer, a coach, whatever the things that we do are, now who am I? Like that's the question, and being willing to kind of get curious about that and and explore that, then go be a lawyer. I mean, then you can be a very successful and and probably more impactful lawyer, much nicer to be around. Um, with this other question that's that's you're walking with, not just how's this case going to turn out. Um, so that's how I love. That's the kind of the the deeper question that you're walking with is who am I really or how am I the, the core of us all at the essence is at the risk of sounding very non-lawyery love and joy and vulnerability and courage and all these things they are, are they are natural qualities and we spend our lives like uh putting up protections because we do because life's hard and it's normal and everybody does it but if we can put some energy into starting to relax some of those things who we are is already there. Um, it's just kind of opens up some space for those qualities to come forth naturally without really trying to be nicer to people or having to, I need to try to be more compassionate. Like that's, it, it doesn't need to be an effort, but it, it just takes a different way of, of showing up. Um, right. And I, yeah. and I think, you know, you, you touched on it and it's not to say that all of us are in that space all the time, right? But it's no. you mentioned it, that when you get that glimpse of it, that's where that richness comes from, is that experience that you're really connected with with just the greater whole. Right. Yeah. And Absolutely. seeing a sunset and actually being stopping in your tracks. Right. Like right. having access to that. Right. Um, 
Yeah. And I, my goal is I don't do it well, but I hope to be more in that and then come out sometimes and notice that I've come out versus where I am now, which is mostly I, I forget, <laughs> but I'm, I'm working on remembering more and more that, that there's more to me than just what happens. Right. Or, or my goals. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. You, you know, Bill, one of the, the things on this subject that uh, is witness consciousness, being the witness of, of our thoughts and of our emotions. And that witness sees things more realistically than, than our ego involvement in it. Mm -hmm. And, and apropos of all this, my belief is we, we become who we hang out with. We become who we hang out with, with people, with emotions, with feelings, with uh, uh, our thoughts. Uh, and so that uh, by hanging out with, with higher level, more significant uh, senses of goodness, um, we are more likely uh, to become that. And, uh, and, and being able to witness ourselves, then we really do see how our mind is just an idea machine. And, mm -hmm. and who's in control of the mind? Is the mind in control of us? Or are we in control of our mind? And that's why it's important learning how to concentrate, learning how to reassert our power over what we think and what we do. To me, that's part of wellness, that's part of uh, generating a greater feeling of emotional fulfillment and well-being. Well, I, I could talk to you guys all day um, about this and at some point may. <laughs> we'll call you after. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but for now, um, I, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to thank both of you and, and uh, really appreciate the time today. Really appreciate the insight. Um, these are, are um, uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. That that idea of, I, I've described it to Elizabeth before as in that fleeting moment that I can grab who I am at my core. It's like catching lightning in a bottle and. Um, and it's a tremendous feeling and I'm hoping I can do more of it yeah. uh, and not spend so much time up, up in my head. Um, but I appreciate both of you very much. I appreciate uh, all of you out there who listened to uh, us today and um, ask you to tune in again next month. We'll have another topic for you. And uh, thank you both. Thanks so much, Bill. Also for thank you, Bill. Thanks questions. for the bar doing this. Thank you for listening. This episode was produced by the State Bar of New Mexico's Wellbeing Committee and the New Mexico Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program. All editing and sound mixing was done by Blue Sky e -Lord. Intro music is by Gil Flores. The views of the presenters are that of their own and are not endorsed by the State Bar of New Mexico. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical